more people than we usually have, so. No, no, it was, it was me taking a video of my pets the other day. Oh, <laughs> that's amazing. I actually had this idea that I was, I, I had a, never mind, I, I had a idea that I would like, there would be like different walls with like, you know, multiple ones of these around, but that that would be we didn't cool. quite got that together yet. So everyone here knows Professor Kevin Johnson, yes? And you, do you know everyone here? No, I don't. We should okay. have to go around. Perhaps we could go around and introduce ourselves so you yeah. know us. And if you're like a student here, just say what program you're in or whatever you're doing. Okay. Munjid, would you like to start? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Munjid Murad. I'm a, a THD student at the Divinity School in Comparative Religion Researching Islam and Christianity and Nature. <laughs> <laughs> That's me not being able to control myself. <laughs> <laughs> she is very pretty. Uh, my name is Terry Tempest Williams, and I'm writer in residence at the Harvard Divinity School. Hi, I'm Casey McConnell. I use she, her pronouns. I am a dual MTS here at HDS and um, MALD, which is Master of Arts in Law and Diplomacy at the Fletcher School at Tufts, and this is my final year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey everyone, my name is Kyle Kaplan. Uh, I'm a third year MDiv student uh, focusing on Buddhist ministry. Uh, I'm Ryan Jenkins. I work for IT and Media Services. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Bob and Bo, <laughs> and I'm a first year MDiv. I'm Brooke Williams. I'm former resident of this place, Terry to Terry Temple School. I'm Lauren I'm Sarah Carrico. I'm a researcher over at the Museum of Comparative Zoology, and I am an arachnologist and working artist. Oh, a what acknowledgist? Arachnologist, so I study spiders. Oh, that's so cool. And I do large scale public art installations. Hi, I'm Amy. I use two pronouns, and I'm a second year MD student. I'm Sue Butler. Let's see. The entire year has been suspicious. I'm Gretchen Legler, I'm a third year MD. Mary Balkin, I'm also a third year MD. I'm Alyssa Tanner, just at the uh, college studying the world. Thank you so much for coming, everybody, and um, uh, thank you, Mary, for inviting me. Um, this is going to be a quite informal presentation with very rough notes, um, and I also want to say this is the first time I have presented on this topic at all, and I'm really happy that it would be in the context of this group, which uh, I feel very much at home with you, and so thank you so much. And, um, okay, so um, uh, this is a project about um, how much I love animals, and I'm just starting with some images that I took the other day. This is, in some ways, I had some kind of vision that I would have, like, you know, there would be a special screening room, and we would have wall-to-wall -wall cats, and basic, and part of it has to do with, um, excuse me, um, <laughs> come on, guys, don't do that. Um, um, did something get unplugged? <laughs> I think basically you have to, uh, maybe I unplugged it. Um, yeah, okay. cool back here. No, it's fine now, it's fine. Oh, oh, no, oh no, it's not fine. It's is not this? fine. Okay. Nick showed me earlier, and I was like, okay, I see, that's how it works. And but it's completely connected. So, 
Sorry, I'm plugging it from your computer and plugging it back in. From my computer? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be talking about a project that uh, some of you know I started to teach and then this past fall I was on sabbatical and I stayed at home and I managed to get like a first very large chunky chapter written. This is part of like the scene and as, you, as the talk goes on you'll, you'll appreciate a little bit more about why I'm showing just it's my domestic scene it sort of came out of my domestic scene and in a certain way it's very much about um, nothing going on, nothing happening, but actually some very subtle things are happening, including, I don't know if we get to this, I, I start making eye contact with Mamaki, the one who's on the top, she, she's like looking at me for a while, so it's sort of more about the kind of presence of animals uh, in the project, and it's also just to introduce the talk as being about um, these guys are part of me and my very being ever since I've been, ever since I've been like one or whatever I can remember, um, animals are just so important to me. So as you probably, most of you know, I'm, um, um, just so you can see, by the way, this is like, it's a very great perch, because where she is, so the window is right there, so they can sleep and look out the window at the same time and see what's going on. They do go outside, by the way, so they have an indoor outdoor, but they can keep track of any interesting birds that are out there or other items. <laughs> Uh, being cats. Um, um, so anyway, um, my field is, I, that's just me praising her. Um, uh, I do Tibetan Buddhist studies and I have written, you know, I've had a long career. I'm kind of at the end of my career. A couple of years ago, I published a book on medicine in Tibet intellectual history, I practically killed myself writing this thing. It took me more than 10 years and it was a huge project. And I said, okay folks, I've worked as hard as I can. Now I'm gonna teach for a few more years and everything, I'm done like going crazy. And then I did come up with this idea that, you know, I would like to write about animals as, um, you know, it's not anything that I've been trained in. It's not my field, but maybe just as a way of getting into something that I really, you know, at the end of my life that I can finally do something that's not so much of a professional thing. It would be more with, with the idea that I have a broader audience. Um, and, um, but as I have started to get into it, first of all, just by teaching it, and then actually in this uh, experience being at home for a semester, um, I, my mind just exploded with, first of all, excitement and the richness of this topic. I am so, so it's like, oh my God, I wish I was like 18 and I could be starting over my whole life and because there is so much in this, I feel, you know, I mean, again, I haven't really sh too much shared this with anyone, but I'm certain that this is something that hooks into a million different amazing issues. Um, and it's really hard actually to contain all the, all the parameters of it. Uh, but I'm very, very excited about it. It, um, you know, I've been using the term the post-human, um, and uh, that certainly is a term that's out there in the literature right now. For me, what the post-human means is um, getting beyond the human-centric, um, you know, obsession that human beings have indeed created over the last several thousand years to the point now where it's, it's, it's clearly to our detriment and it's out of control. Uh, but even if it wasn't out of control, I would still believe that it's not right. And, you know, I don't myself feel comfortable in a totally human-centric world. You know, sometimes I think of what could life be like, say we didn't have animals at all in some kind of weird way. You know, I can't imagine being able psychologically to survive. You know, I need them as part of my world. Uh, but anyway, so the whole post-human thing, there's a lot of really interesting writing happening in it, in this area. Um, what um, I um, started 
to do, after I taught the class a couple of times, in which I really didn't know what I was doing, but the one thing that did happen was that I really felt it connected with the students actually very well. I felt both times it really clicked, and I had a very diverse group of students in that class, so I knew there was something in there. But when I was on sabbatical, I decided to you know, really let myself, um, let the process unfold and see where it's going and what am I really, what, and you know, it's a, you know, should I really be writing for a popular audience? I, you know, I'm not used to writing for anything other than you know, four other Tibetologists in <laughs> the world. And you know, am, am I allowed to do that? And, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. What I found myself, and I guess you'll see that as, as I start to tell you about it, I found myself writing primarily, I think, in the realm of what is called phenomenology. So it's become a, a quite, it's, it's, not it's both autobiographical, it's got, I'm trying to write it in a very lyrical and way with um, uh, lots of like autobiographical and stories and lots of images, as I'll show you. But I guess the hard work of what I think that I'm doing is phenomenological in the sense that it's tracking a kind of um, uh, perception, the process of perception, the process of knowing. A actually, basically what I'm thinking of the project as a way of uh, fostering, let's say, fostering a new kind of subjectivity or, or, th or expanding our understanding of the possibilities of subjectivities. And I have a clear idea of why I'm doing that, and it's two parts. One, it, so it, it has to do with paying more attention to the animal world. And let me, let me just add that the, the primary, primary motivation that I have is my absolute sorrow, sorrow and horror at the way animals are being tortured and treated on our planet today in, in a way that most of us never even see or confront and if you do see, especially in factory farming, not to mention scientific testing, not to mention just the you know animals in zoos, the way people treat their animals when they own them, uh, but you know factory farming, you know it's just and, and you know it, it's hidden from view. We hardly ever get a glimpse of it, and my heart is just broken. Uh, and so that's that's what's motivating me, why I have to do this, and not like just space out into retirement anytime soon. <laughs> I have to do another project. Um, but okay, and so what, what my approach is, and I have no idea whether it, this is gonna help or not, but I feel that it might, is through this phenomenological uh, approach, looking at types of subjectivity, and the, here's the two parts of it. One is learning how to notice and see animals more and better. Just paying attention to them, being able to see them, um, and, uh, and, and, and I think that when we see them and we look at them and we learn how to see them, that we will recognize and notice their value better. And we will value them more. We will see um, what's so amazing about them. And therefore, we will take better care of them. When you see how precious and valuable they are, we, wouldn't, we couldn't help but take better care of them. So that's the primary motivation. I also think at the very same time, however, it'll also help us as, being, as, as human beings. So it's, it's to help animals, but it also will help us to the extent that we expand our, or expand, shift, develop our kinds of subjectivity to be more attuned, more like animals. I, I'm not trying to say that we should become animals, you know, nothing like that. But, we're, but by looking at animals a lot, we will also um, learn to, to live in a way, we'll, we'll live with other humans in a better way as well. And we'll also have a happier life and a more fulfilled life, just to be straightforward. So that's the two sides of it. By virtue of being more attuned to something that's really important, we'll take better care of it and it'll help us as well. So that's my idea. Um, let me just show you three um, short videos that, so part of, one of the, the uh, biggest inroads into this um, project is just learning how absolutely fantastic uh, animals are. I'm just going to show you three short videos. 
which will show that. Uh, oh, okay, good, it's happening. This is video number one, wait, wait, wait. Those of you who are in my class have seen this. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this in your lives. This is something that happens all over the world. There's actually plenty of different videos of this. Hi. Um, but it is the annual ritual when the cows are kept in the barn all winter and they're let out in the spring. And the local people know that this is going to happen and they all come to watch it because... Where is this place, Jay? I don't know. It's somewhere. <laughs> um, I think in the, in, it's, in the, it's in the United States, but you can find stuff like this all over. Look, I just want to cry every time I see this. Look how happy they are. You can see it. You know, they know. They are so happy. They know. Look, they're celebrating. And would you believe the cows are so graceful and can jump like this? Look, they all know it. I've never seen it. Is it wonderful? It is wonderful. And part of what I'm interested in, by the way, oh, look at oh. this. This is a calf. Yeah. I don't think it's ever. Look, look, the mother. Oh they're running together. This looks like a dog. Look, look, <laughs> look, at, look at the way its, it's, it's, it's tail is in the air. And they're like so happy. All right, that's video number one. Uh, video number two. This is also an amazing video. There's so many amazing things. Whatever. <laughs> okay, we have to go to Harvard Secure, one second. There's so many amazing videos online that you can find and, okay. All right. Okay, maybe. This is like some, Random, some guys are in the ocean. They're in a boat in, in the north somewhere. And this beluga whale, like, they don't know this whale. This whale <laughs> comes up to them. Look, and look what happens. He sees a whale. Oh, he's, he's playing with him. Oh, he brings him this, and they're, they're, or I don't know how it started. This whale has never met a human being, is playing with these guys in a boat. How does he get the, how does he know <laughs> that, that, th that humans will play with you? Hey, you dropped your ball, bud. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but he, you know, this interest, he just recognizes these are other intelligent people. Let's play. I mean, it's just like amazing to me. This is a wild beluga, not trained, and it's not in any sea world or any horrible thing like this. Okay, here he goes. Oh, my God. Okay, that's number two. Amazing video. And number three. Okay, this is an amazing video. This is a video of apparently some guy. It's, I think it's from some South American country. I don't know where it is. Again, we can find it out. But um, I think so. this guy helped save a calf, a, a mother's no. uh, calf. Okay, just watch this. This calf is, this cow is, the mother cow is like thanking this guy. Look at this. And the, the guy, this is this most beautiful guy. Look at this guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually didn't realize until recently that cows are extremely affectionate also with each other, like with friends, yes. not just, yeah. actually Casey could tell you all about, she could give you a whole lecture on cows. But, um, <laughs> but, um, Okay, wait. It goes on. Yeah. This guy is so sweet. And he's obviously done something to help the cow and... Wait a minute. Where's the good part? What happened to the good part? Oh. And he's like going crazy. The cow just like... But look also at the beauty of the cow, how, how slow it moves, but how totally graceful and beautiful. 
and you know he's just you know he just wants to she just wants to thank him yeah look look at him he's like crying and <laughs> it's just so fantastic how much you know appreciation understand the cow understands and is grateful okay um back to my talk okay so um uh, let me just tell you about the project just a little bit um Part of this is like inspired by a famous essay that those who took my class know about by Thomas Nagel, a philosopher, who um, it's called, um, what is it called? What it's like to be a bat? Yeah. He argues that we can never know what it's like to be a bat. And basically, his point is that we never know what it's like to be another creature. We never can get inside the head of another creature. He uses the example of a bat as something that's so foreign to us, it's so different than us that, but I think his argument would also pertain, excuse me, to other human beings as well. Um, but, um, but his point is, is that we only know our experience like from the inside, and we never can get a glimpse of that. Um, we never get a glimpse really inside of anybody else's experience. We can only maybe think about it or imagine it or see it as an object. And I want to contest that. I don't think it's exactly true. It's not the case that we totally know what is in other people's heads or, what, or that, we can un and that we can connect with other animals and know what's inside other animals' experience. But it's not that it's a, a, a big iron wall either. And we have access to, the f to others. And so part of what I'm talking about is, um, what happens when you see, like for example, when we see those cows, um, we, we celebrate with them, we see them from the outside, we just see their bodily affects from the outside, but we feel a certain joy inside, you know, and, and why is that? How does what we see on the outside get inside of us? I don't think it's the case that we are totally, that we have no access to the experience of others. So I'm going to, this is like, this is actually going to be the first chapter. So the, the book that I'm now planning, and so when I was on sabbatical, I wrote the first chapter of what I think is going to be a three-chapter book. So the first chapter, and I'll tell you more about that in detail in a moment, but first I'll tell you the other two chapters. So the first chapter is about how to be in the present and how to actually co... I talk about this notion of being with, how you can be with others uh, in a shared... Uh, subjectivity in a certain kind of way. That's chapter one. And chapter two is, so there's a lot of philosophical problems that come up with this thing. And one of them is, well, how do you have knowledge? So my, my emphasis in the whole book is being present, being in the present, not in the past and not in the future. How do you know anything if you're only living totally in the present moment? How are you informed by pa the past? You know, so is knowing even possible? So the second um, chapter is about s how do animals know? Animals certainly know a whole lot of stuff, but they don't go to school and they don't, you know, tell each other like, you know, big stories. Th I don't think they think about the past very much, and I don't, I don't know, but I don't think they think about the past and about the future, but they do have ways of knowing and they do imbibe and, and have access to the past um, and um, uh, and so I want to talk about very special kinds of knowing that are immediate, the bodily kinds of knowing, but just the, the whole process of knowing. And here's another video. Wait a minute. Is this the right way to show this? Um, okay, I'll show this now. This not. Never mind. I'll show this in a moment. Uh, so ways of knowing. And I'm just trying to. Oh yeah. Here's here's one example that I can just tell you. At the, this is my cat, Toby San, and he, at the moment, unfortunately, he has some kind of problem with his intestines, actually. I went to the vet, and we're giving him a steroid now. I'm a little, a little worried about him, but so far the medicine is working. But the way 
it's very hard to give him a pill in his mouth, but there's a way that you can give him steroids. It's a cream and you rub it on the inside of their ear, which I have to do twice a day. And he hates getting a pill, but rubbing him in, in, in the ear, it's, it's, he doesn't really like it, but it's okay. But he would rather you don't mess with his ears. So I've been doing this now for three weeks, after about a week. And so what you, what you do is you get a little bit of cream, you know, this is a dispenser, and then I just have to hold him and like go like this and rub it in his ear for two, two minutes. He, like, this cat is so smart. Like, as soon as, you know, so I go in the bathroom, I close the door, I turn the water on, I'm making noise so, so he won't hear me doing the click with the thing. And then I get the cream, and then like I like go, you know, and I pretend that I'm not going towards him. <laughs> and I have my hand, he can't see the cream. And I'm like thinking, okay, I'm gonna wash the dishes now. That cat knows. <laughs> I cannot trick him. I have been trying. Actually, the one thing that worked the other day is when I picked up the dish towel. For some reason, when I picked up the dish towel, I said, okay, she's, she's gonna do her dish towel thing now. And then he, he like relaxed. But, but that was the one time that it just took a minute and he realized what I'm doing. He's so smart. He can tell. You know, and I'm really trying. I'm really like trying to be, I'm not looking at him, I'm looking over there, and so on. So he knows a lot of this, huge numbers of, this huge amount of stuff that animals know. Chapter number three is about ethics. And one of the big philosophical problems of this project is that, um, you know, a lot of it is about being in the present, being spontaneous, using your bodily knowledge. But we have to recognize you know, you might want to argue with me on this, but there's, that's not necessarily ethical. It's not the case that, uh, first of all, there's lots of impulsive, spontaneous people who are living in the present who are evil and horrible, okay? It's not a guarantee that being totally present, I don't think, guarantees that you're good. And the whole notion of the good, this, I think, is the place where some human rational thought needs to intermix with the practices that I'm trying, I'm trying to cultivate types of bodily knowledge and habitual kinds of knowledge and at the same time some kind of rational, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that animals necessarily ever step back and say, you know, what is the larger good for everyone? Animals you know, have a certain ethic and there's a, a lot of, you know, we, we see them doing all kinds of positive, wonderful things. You know, they also kill each other in a flash. They're not necessarily compassionate. I think there's an ethical dimension that I'm not sure is guaranteed by the phenomenology and that's, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. I have some ideas about that. One of them, I'm using um, certain Buddhist ideas Oh, I haven't started to do this yet, but certain Buddhist ideas of uh, practices that, like repetitive practices that are informed by a certain kind of idea. There's too much to tell you now, but and anyway, that's gonna be, I'm, I'm going to um, try to work ethics into the final chapter and figure out what kind of practices are, are gonna, I'm gonna write on my body certain kinds mm -hmm. of principles, which I think that's maybe the human, you know, not, I'm not in, you know, not a great fan of, rationalization all the time, but yet there's some rational dimension to this, okay? That's the project, three chapters. Let me just tell you about chapter one. Um, so, um, I already talked about, so it, this is about seeing, and it's also about the other um, kinds of uh, uh, sense perceptions as well, uh, but a lot of it is at least based on seeing to begin with. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's also about hearing and it's also about feeling and it's also about t touching and smelling, tasting in some ways as well. Um, two parts of it that I think are very important just as general principles are, first of all, what I mentioned that the feeling when you see something that you really love and like, that's a really like important signal that you should pay attention to. Um, that it had, and that's why, you know, something like looking at those cows coming out of the barn, I think there's very something very important when we see something like that and we're so happy about it and we can 
use that as fuel and fodder for the project. The other thing that I want to just say right now, just in general, is something about slow looking, but also fast looking. There's a lot of talk these days about doing stuff slow, and I, a lot of what I'm getting into is like slowing down to see the, the nuances and the details of stuff that we often, you know, sort of rush over and don't actually detect or track or pick up because we're moving too fast. We're moving too fast in our conceptualization. So staying with the subject, be, and it has a lot to do with something like mindfulness, you know, so it's, a lot of this is coming out of the stuff I know from Buddhism, but slowing down. And yet at the same time, there's also a fastness. I'm trying to work this out because there's also part of the seeing, and I think that animals, again, are really good at this, is they can, they can size things up in, in a flash also. So this is one of the problems. I'm not exactly sure how these two things are exactly connected, but you kind of need them both at the same time. One way, an example of um, how these two things might work together, you know, when I watch my cats, like the cats who are on the couch, and you see them, you know, cats like lay around a lot. They spend a lot of time in the day either sleeping or, you know, a lot of times their eyes are open and they're just like hanging out there enjoying being there. They, you know, and they're very luxuriant and they slowly lick their bodies. But, you know, if, for example, prey come, or if a danger, somebody's like a dog is trying to catch, bam, they know in one second, and they can move like really, really fast. They can pivot on a dime. And I think both of those characters are at least part of the subjectivity that I want to foster, being slow and also being fast. Okay, another principle. So I, I talk a lot about being in the present. I'm developing this notion of something called the thick present. So the present is not a, a flash. It, for, the present has thickness, it has some extension, you have time in the present. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of these philosophical like conundrums of, oh, we're never in the present because it's fleeting so fast and it's always going. I actually think that there's another way of conceiving of being in the present that has to do with, um, you know, actually uh, expanding the present so you have more space to move around in it. And, um, okay, so the thick present, this is actually something that Donna Haraway has talked about, the thick present as well, maybe in a slightly different way. Uh, it has to, there's, um, okay, um, at least two very nice types of being in the present are purring. Mm -hmm. Again, my, my examples for tonight are a lot of cat examples, but the, I really could give examples for many other, other animals, but you have to admit that purring is like an amazing mm -hmm. thing. What is purring? You know, these guys, they're like rumbling. Their bodies are like vibrating. They're not doing anything. They're just going back and forth. This is what I call the thick present. It's like <laughs> <laughs> But they're rumbling. There's something vibrating. And I think that's what I mean by the thick present is that it's not just bunk. It's like they're going back and forth within this tiny place. And it's a way, it's, it's first of all the way that they express their pleasure. You know, it's another thing. I don't know if you're a cat lover or not, but there's no, you can't hear a cat purr and not be amazingly happy. You know, why? Mm. Why is that such a great mm. sound? Or maybe you can, maybe one of you is saying, I hear purring, I don't like cats. <laughs> okay. But most people, okay, another one is licking as we just, you know, so these are ways to enjoy the thick present. Not necessarily recommending that for human behavior, mm. but animals do it a lot. And, and, you know, it's this amazing way where, um, you know, the, per the one, the person, the person who's licking is like taking in the substances. So this is one of the ways that you're being with the other, you're licking whatever is on the surface of their skin. And then the person who's being licked is like, it's, it's such a fantastic feeling, especially again, to be licked by a cat with their very rough tongues, or I can imagine this guy being licked by the cow, that their tongues are so, flexible and graceful and there's a way in which the, 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 the tongue follows the contours of your body in such a kind of delicate and amazing way again so these are like examples of the thick present i'm going to show you um okay i got to get back to that late, later but here's just some 
um, in a, uh, examples of animals. No, why are you doing that? Oh no, that's right. Okay, excuse me. So um, animals just like to be. So again, these are two. This is a mother and its child. You know what are they doing here? They're like being together. And so this, these are some examples of ways in which, no, it's not that my subjectivity is over there. There's a way of participating, just like a few images of this that um, I, horses are really, uh, horses love this a lot, you know, and actually in, in my chapter, I actually come up with a theory that why certain animals have very long nozzles is to all the better to be with you right here. <laughs> so, yeah, like, what's this long nozzle that they have? <laughs> But, you know, they, they love to have their snouts, like just, you know, they can feel each other, they can feel each other's warmth. Uh, here's a image of, uh, this is a slightly different, this is the dog on the right, that's Wendy Doniger's dog, and we're on the beach uh, with a dog that they play with every day. And they, I, I don't know what's going on here, they're c clearly communicating. Uh, they're uh, standing next to, very close, so again, they're mm. feeling each other's hot breath. It looks to me like Kim, the dog over here, is they're like just discussing the rules of the game, like <laughs> <laughs> before they, but it's just like, you know, these dogs are all brought by their owners from different places, and once they get on the beach together, they say, okay, guys, you know, so this is like the first moment, we're here together, you know, and then they're going to start playing. Actually, I have a whole analysis of play as well in this, but I'm not going to get into that right now. But anyway, I'm just showing you examples of being with. Uh, and am I am I running out of time? Um, we have um, our, our meeting is officially scheduled until eight o'clock. Okay. So, so maybe leave a little time at the end oh, yeah, for yeah. people to ask questions time. in that. But maybe but another fifteen minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. And then um, just like. You know, something about having someone else close by. There was a, a story recently, some great race horse uh, was in their stall. You know, these guys who are bred, I don't really like the whole practice at all. They're bred like in this really very specialized way and you know, the, to run, but whatever. And they're in their, this, guy, this horse is in their stall, but apparently this particular horse had taken a liking to some goat, I guess, because from the farm that it lived on most of the time. And this horse, like, ha it was a very high-strung, nervous horse. It had to have the goat with it all the time. So mm -hmm. even when they went to one of these, these big racetracks, the owners had to take the goat. And the goat, when you see the, I don't have a photo, photo of it, it's like this huge, big, fat goat, which, you know, because they just, because that doesn't have anything to do, it just is, like, eating all day long. <laughs> and it just sleeps in the, in the horse's stall. But the horse wants the goat there <laughs> all the time. And when, even when they let the goat out to go to the ba bathroom, the horse gets very upset and is, puts his, his long snout out and is like all upset until, you, you need, it's like you're familiar, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. you, know, ha, you, you know, and that's, there's a huge pleasure in that, you know, somebody being with you, you're not talking, you don't have to do anything, it's just being there. Um, these are just examples of ways that animals be with. Um, one, um, uh, Developing out of this, um, I, I'm, I talk a lot about the virtue of grace. And um, one of the things about animals, and I, I don't know if I can make a, a, you know, a universal statement about all animals, but in general, animals are extremely graceful. What is grace? And um, what's entailed with it? You know, oftentimes your breath is taken away by their grace. And uh, here's an example. This is Toby San. He's you know he's not moving here. He's just sitting on the table outside. But there's something. What what I understand grace to be is a way in which your body is flexible enough that it's mindful of every micro shift in the environment around it. I think when people are graceful, you know, or, or animals are graceful, they move in a way that's, it's as if they have, you know, many, many joints in their body, whereas when you're not graceful, when you're clumsy, you're like, you know, at odd angles. And I think animals are more comfortable in the physical world 
and there, so there's something about you know allowing yourself to melt into whatever it is it happens to be a table or it happens to be you know a chair or wherever you are just um, they have an amazing ability again I kind of blew that up too big but um, you know just looking at it again you just see the way it's so comfortable in its environment so something very much about grace these are this is not a dead horse this is a horse that sleeps I didn't realize by the way that horses lay down like this and sleep do they I'm like it shows what I know not all of them. okay but uh, but look at this but look at look, look at the way its neck you know when I lay on the bed I have to have 50 million cushions like to keep me from my bones all getting their body mm. sinks into the earth mm. uh, and I think there's a great virtue in, in mm. this kind of um, capacity I think that grace has to do with responsiveness so you know getting back to my example of licking licking is an enormously graceful thing to do in which again your tongue is following all the cracks and crevices of the person's part of the body that you're licking and that's what makes it graceful and again it's making f it's breaching the boundaries between one and the other which is what I'm trying to get at uh, responsiveness um, uh, there's many different issues that I'm talking about with respect so seeing beauty is also a kind of responsiveness mm -hmm. I get into things about hearing as well I give an example of um, one night some time ago I was actually in a foreign country in a hotel room and heard like a dog on the street bark in like the middle of the night and woke up and was struck with just oh this voice that you can hear so much in his voice like you know hearing an, is another you know very great sense there's such a capacity to hear so much in just the way that the the air is moving out of the the, the voice box and all of that stuff um, how we you know the amazing thing for example of how we can recognize each other's voices uh, which is really quite amazing you know somebody will call you 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 haven't heard that from them in years and you hear their voice and you immediately know them mm. one word what's that about mm. you don't see them it's just like hi Janet you know and you know who it is mm -hmm. how do we do that you know our hearing is actually extremely sensitive so I'm really exploring these kinds of perceptual uh, possibilities um, I, I write up here a lot also about eye contact which is a very special mm -hmm. kind of perception which I'm still thinking about really a lot uh, and how um, you know when someone is looking at you and this is why as soon as I start talking about eye contact I can't look at anybody <laughs> here because like uh, but um, you always know if someone is looking at you by the way you can see Toby is looking directly at me you can tell if, if you can see his eyes actually come to think of it maybe it's I'm not sure he's looking actually directly at me and, and anyway I have a camera but um, uh, Toby is really great at making eye contact eye contact is something that animals do a lot it's something they do to threaten each other you know yeah. what's going on with eye contact what is it that you see when you look into the eyes of another person and again I'm exploring ways in which something really special is happening with that and I don't know what it is like that sounds, it feels, sounds like a Bob Dylan song you know mm. something's happening but you don't know what it is do you <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really fascinated by that I so there is also a, another Buddhist thing that I'm drawing on is there is a kind of there's like they talk Buddhists talk a huge amount about mind and consciousness and knowing the whole doctrine there's types of consciousnesses and the main kind of consciousness they talk about all the time is mental consciousness mm -hmm. your mind or your brain but they also mention eye consciousness nose consciousness so all of the sense organs have a kind of consciousness they don't actually say anything about it hardly but I think there's a special kind of knowing capacity that the sense organs themselves have which is not necessarily going to the brain maybe I, I don't know I'm just making this up now but anyway something very special with eye consciousness let me show you this great video now of 
this is a spec. I, I kind of put this in here because I wanted to show it to you. Um, it doesn't fit exactly what I'm saying, but this is one of the many things that happened with, with that I've started to notice with my cats that I never was aware of before. Is that they not only do they make eye, eye contact with you when they want you to feed them, and there's like this whole thing like when I'm working, which is all the time, and I'm always like this, my cat will come and sit like right here just like the one place where there's room for me to see him and he'll be staring at me mm -hmm. for 15 minutes and I'll look down and boom, the eyes are there. And then as soon as he sees me, he says, so he does this thing where he throws his head. When, when he has your eye, he, he holds your eye and then goes like this, like, come on. <laughs> you, go, you know, meaning go to the kitchen. You, I'm going to show you, I captured this on film. It's not going to the kitchen. This was across the street from my house. Cats also love when their owners go outside with them and they want them to follow them and to play with them and to go with them. So you're gonna see four moments very quickly, you have to look quickly, where he catches my eye and he's going, he, he goes like this, like, go this way. Mom, see you, ring. Okay, so. Um, come on. Me to follow him. Watch, watch. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> two, watch, wait. He's, he's going to do it again. One sec. <laughs> <laughs> he is totally, he wants, he thinks I can jump up there, you know. And go. But, um, one of the many kinds of micro communicative <laughs> acts. Then he's just being a silly cat, and you know, that's that's the end. <laughs> but um, one of the, you know, I've seen him. The, the two cats do that with each other. These are the kind of things you notice. Yes. Amazingly sophisticated communication is going on, often in a flash. You know, they get mad at each other, they fight, they smack each other. I said, what just happened? And I saw he insulted her. You know, and she's mad, and she gives him like a little smack, and you know, very precise. Movements, you know, you have to be really, really fast to see this kind of thing. But you know how intelligent they are. Okay, um, where are we? Oh yeah. Okay, uh, just a couple of other things that I'm exploring. One of them has to do with one of the things that the slow looking also helps you to do. At the same time as you are trying to connect and break down the wall between your subjectivity and that of others, you also have to, it's a very other important side of it, is you have to also appreciate that the, I'm not calling for a collapse between self and other, and you have to appreciate, to be able to see that the other is different from you as well. It's a very, very important part of this kind of seeing which has to do with you not projecting your expectations or your conceptions, but allowing the thing to speak for itself or to, you know, for you to be able to see what it is on its own terms. That's a very hard thing to do. Again, it's very similar to the types of things that people talk about in Buddhism. I am playing on the idea of the aleatory, which is a nice word that I found, um, which has to do with the fact that in a way, first, it has to do with the fact that everything is constantly changing anyway, and you never know in any given moment what's going to happen next. So one of the way, one of the reasons why you, we need to be alert in the moment and stay in the present, we have to be very vigilant because everything is constantly shifting. And we need to watch and see what's out there, but we also have to be able to connect with it. We, and, and so something about being vigilant to the way that the other is different than you, it's, it's communicating or feeling or doing things that you're not actually picking up. Um, but also, I think the um, paying attention to the way things are always changing and things are often unpredictable, they're not in your control also, which is a very big part of it. You know, not to assume that, you know, I'm controlling what's happening. There's things outside of me. I don't believe that, I, you know, I'm the only subject at all. There's actual real other beings there. Is uh, being able to, so I talk a lot about improvisation, 
and the capacity again to turn on the dime to be able to first of all not let your expectations get in the way so that you're able to uh, go with what's happening and kind of shift what your project is again animals are extremely good at this they're good at it again for hunting purposes for both being prey and being predators but they also are good at it in I, I think that they actually enjoy that kind of of you know sudden shift and change uh, one of the kind of ideas that I'm also trying to develop in this project has to do you know scientists in general try to reduce everything about animals although it's all about you know survival and predation and and then the reason that they you know are very alert in the present is because of that and I think that that's an error I think yes that's true about animals but I think that animals also very much enjoy and so there's this notion of emergence that out of something maybe very basic higher order they, uh, you know, and I see so many examples of, again, my cats and I, uh, you know, other animals I could show you, you know, not only cats by any means, um, who make use, you know, who actually, so it's like an artistic and a creative practice also of, oh, here's a great story, um, which is to illustrate this, is of, Excuse me for those of you who are in my class, because I'm sure you've heard this. I have to stand, stand up to tell it. There's this story of, there's like a bunch of ele elephants in um, somewhere, and they're all like, um, you know, eating their hay and stuff. And, and I believe that one of the, ele what's not the dominant, like the matriarch, but another elephant. So you know how elephants, like when they don't have anything to do, they often swing their trunks around. So <laughs> this elephant was observed, um, you know, standing next to this elephant and had you know, it was finished with its hay, and then while it's like, uh, you know? <laughs> and so it was like using the kind of moment to like, you know, play with and just very creatively, you know, and it's it's about you know pretending and 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 all sorts of things. When my cats want me to feed them. And and uh, you know I you know I'm busy I'm working on the computer you know I'll feed you later and they're like getting really frustrated they start do, with the, they're trying to get my attention and they'll start doing you know one of the things sometimes I don't feed them just so they start doing these <laughs> antics you know literally I'm sitting on the couch on my computer and the guy like flies over my head and and they, they make these like sounds like boom, 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 and zoom and what they really want you to do is chase them and that they'll and they'll lead you into the kitchen or their, their bowl but they they're creative they're it's not just survival they enjoy um two two just one other thing uh, i i'm part of the aleatory part of being open to flowing with being attentive to things changing is um you know the virtues of meandering um the virtues of dreaming um virtues of sleeping i'm a big advocate of sleeping so this is i think my video <laughs> um, of cats who shamelessly you know i sometimes wonder maybe the whole point of life is to dream you know mm. so like when you're awake you you get your food you s stock up on your calories so you can have time to sleep um so um i i end this chapter with kinds of practices I, i've talked enough now so i'm going to stop this is kind of the things that i'm exploring i'm putting them together as virtues in the final chapter on ethics, I'm actually trying to develop certain practices, a lot of which have to do with being at home, being, you know, with your backyard, uh, you know, depending on where you live, obviously, uh, uh, but, you know, paying more attention, obviously, to, you know, spending time actually, you know, deliberately watching animal life around you and, all the things that you learn um, from that practice, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. But anyway, I'm going to stop now, and, and and if you have feedback of any kind, I'd love to hear it. So thank you. We can put the cats back on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would just like to share with you that um, when you were showing us your cat going and continually looking back at you. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, that that's um something in in dog training mm -hmm. that that you um you cultivate because they'll call it checking in and mm -hmm. then you that every time your dog checks in you you want to reward the dog for doing it. And mm -hmm. That's what's right. Really amazing to me about that is how many owners don't see it, mm -hmm. which is exactly mm -hmm. what you were talking about. That's but right. I, like when my mother first got her dog. And she's going, well, I don't know. She's so friendly with everyone. I don't know. Right. And we're going for a walk. And the dog's like, flicking its ear back. Flicking its ear back. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, your dog is very aware of you. <laughs> but she, she wasn't seeing it. Like, she just totally right. was missing it. You have to and train really yourself, and you have to be yes. a, attentive to it. I will so though, say, though, that that's a different thing than what my cat was doing. Those are two different things. Mm -hmm. They're both involving eye contact, mm -hmm. and, and they're both engaging. Mm -hmm. The dog is checking in with mom or dad to see if everything's okay. My cat's not doing that at all. He's trying to tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and he's trying to get my attention to get me to go somewhere. They're yeah. two yeah. different things. Yeah, yeah. They're both really important. No, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I just want to add one more point that um, be before I take further questions. A lot of this chapter, you know, a lot of the time I spent was about noticing the beauty of animals, mm -hmm. appreciating the beauty of animals, how much I love them, how much I'm wonderful. But one big part of it, which I only, you know, shows how I'm only like realizing what this project is about as it's unfolding. But I realize, of course, the other thing that I'm trying to cultivate is being able to see the pain of animals. Mm -hmm. And when you mention dogs, one of the things I'm like, let alone factory farming, I'm afflicted when I see people walking their dogs. You know, most people, and actually my own yeah. brother who lived, grew up in my house, he takes his dog for a walk. The dog, first of all, never can go outside by itself. It only goes out with a leash on its neck, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and then he's like, he says, come on, hurry up. He, the dog wants to smell this bush. He's dragging it along. The dog wants to cross the street. I said, you're out here for 10 minutes with the dog twice a day. Mm -hmm. Let the dog lead you. Like, let it, you know, people are constantly, like, dragging their dogs along, pulling them by their neck. And, you know, I'm starting even to, I start saying things to people. <laughs> Don't call him. Let him look at the bush for two minutes. Will you? You know, the dog wants to look at the bush. Let it. You know, do you realize that it's cooped up in your house forever? For five minutes it wants to smell the bush. Will you let it smell the bush? <laughs> One thing that I thought was interesting was when you commented on animals living almost exclusively in the present. Mm -hmm. I think that biologists are finding out that even that's not necessarily so. Mm -hmm. In that what way? Whales are known to have pretty good senses of story. They have long mm -hmm. oral histories. Since oral we, history? Yes, since we don't know their language, we don't know exactly what it is, but we're pretty suspicious that whales are telling stories that go back quite a way. There's it could well be, yeah. It could well be, yeah. And there's probably some others too. Yeah, with that. Well, bees, totally for right. example, yeah. tell stories. Yes, yeah. and yeah. dogs mourning uh, yeah. at the graves of yeah, where right. their humans yeah. have been buried, yeah. which why they would know that this was a grave, we don't know. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and the way the elephants yeah. go back to the places yeah. where their loved ones have died. And, absolutely. Um, they, elephants they, elephants can recognize the bones yeah. of, mm -hmm. of someone. That's like truly amazing. No, no, I'm going to argue that, so in my earlier life, I edited a book on the notion of memory, and mm -hmm. memory, there's different kinds of memory. There's mm -hmm. so-called representational memory, mm -hmm. there's bodily memory, there's indexical, there's lots of different kinds of memories. Animals have memories, for mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. for sure. And yes, it's not necessarily, they're, they're not yeah. stuck in the present. Yeah. It's just that the kind of memory that they use is not the kind that's valorized in Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is representational memory, where you, where you, you're, you're separate from the thing, but you create an image of something in the past. It's, it's quite plausible that animals even have that to a certain extent. Yeah. Animals remember all kinds of things, you know, yeah. um, birds and squirrels. They hide millions of acorns in the fall. They know where they are. They remember them. All kinds of things. Yes. So, having had a dog for a long time. I started to think about memory versus the signal. You mentioned the signal. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of the what we discussed today in, in the last few minutes suggests that memory is more important than signal. Because my dog would, I, I would think it had a memory of a place that 
you know, there was once a dead deer there, and he would hmm. go back there every time. There was once a what? A what maybe year? it was a signal that okay. was just that accumulating oh, all these signals. Dead deer? And that the whale accumulates a, a ton of signals and tells the story that associates with that signal, mm -hmm. as opposed to having a memory. Well, it depends what you mean reason. by the word memory. Well, you yeah. just described that there's many kinds of memory, which I didn't know about. That's right. But mm -hmm. that's what I'm thinking is that our memory is like, oh, I recognize that fence post because I've been here before. But the dog sees it as a signal, that the signal kind of well, that's what I call index. Something. So that's an indexical yeah. signal. Yeah. I, In other I words, it's connected that. to. Mm. Yeah. And I think that that probably is a lot. Well, our minds work that way as well, yeah. totally. Yeah. But I think animals work. So there's at least of the kinds of memory, there's um, recollection, mm. which is, you know, representing the past. Recognition, which is a little bit different. So when I see you and I recognize you, I don't, I don't remember when I first met her. I don't think to the past. I mm -hmm. see her now and I recognize, yeah. but it's not the same as thinking about the past. And there's other kinds, of, there's a mindfulness kind of memory, a deep sense of who I am in the present, which is like a memory of depth. It's, mm. it's not necessarily tied to the past. And there's a lot of other, you can, I'll send you the introduction to this book that I edited and I did it with a Western phenomenologist. Um, but anyway, that's a hugely, so that's the thing I'm interested in, is these kinds of animal cognitions, which again, humans also have access to, but yeah. we don't foreground them yeah. as much as we like might. The, the, picture, the, the film of the cows coming out after all winter. Yeah. My sense is that, first it's like, oh, they remembered all winter long how terrible it was in there and how great it was gonna be in the spring. Yeah. But maybe not. Maybe they're in the present, and the minute they, the signal is, Oh, we're out now, and we can be joyful about it. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Which so you have to think. What is that? You know. Yeah, so that's that? the kinds of things I'm mm -hmm. trying to think. You know. Do we think that all the time that they're in the barn, that they're saying, "Oh man, moo, moo." <laughs> I, I wish I was out yeah. in those beautiful, fresh, green grass. They feel cramped. They, you know, and I think when they're outside, they, they see that there's an opening. Mm. They see that there's freedom. They see that they have room to jump and run like that because they don't have that. Yeah. I think a lot of cows are probably tied up like all the hell of the time. Yeah. But yes, the, so these are the, all the things that I'm interested I in. Love it. And I love But I'm doing it from what you would call a phenomenological perspective, which means imagining, trying to see it, and not as a scientist using, doing experiments and, and using evidence. It's like, a, you know, I certainly want to draw on that, you know, stuff, and we've been, I've been reading that stuff. But I think there's all kinds of ways that we can have access to it, which is just part of, of imagination, our ability to pay attention, mm. to notice, and stuff like that. Yeah. I think, so first going to the point of um, memory, I think we haven't really mentioned the ways that every part of us hold memory. I think we've been locating it in our minds, which is like a specific kind of memory, but there's also embodied memory. That if your totally. body, yeah, absolutely. And I see that, especially with animals a lot. Um, and the other question I have is going back to your, your vision of the, the book in particular, the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and the ethical dimension and I'm wondering if you're envisioning the ethical dimension as being like this this practice of noticing cultivates a certain kind of ethic sometimes um, versus we if we well maybe both arguments are the same having a specific ethical argument about the treatment of animals like because we can recognize XYZ characteristics within them we should treat them in a certain way going back to your Kind of like larger goal of um, witnessing the horror and then thinking about how do we solve this um, and I think to the question of uh, this kind of noticing as a, as a praxis of uh, an ethical praxis um, and you mentioned this there are plenty of people who notice things and who still continue um, and I had this experience I was talking to a vet the other day who works on cows who does um, a dairy uh, dairy like a veterinary kind of service and she was telling me all the ways that you notice cows behave, and there's so many, and she's mm -hmm. so attuned to it, she's clearly attuned to it, and then she talks about cows as um, uh, products, and she uses the language of like, oh yeah, we gotta separate like the culling, like 
Mm -hmm. this. Colleen, yeah. um, and I wonder then how you think there can be made, I'm wondering which argument, number one, that you're pursuing, if not both, and then two, how you think you can bridge that gap, even when people notice, they still continue to do whatever things that they do. That's the big problem that I'm facing. Yeah. And, um, sorry. Um, you know, I don't actually fully have my answer yet, but I do know that it has to be um, paid attention to. So I think what I'm thinking now, and I haven't really thought it through, but what I'm thinking now is very, very rational arguments like um, if I'm happy and others are not happy, it's never going to work because actually I need everyone around me to be happy in order for me to be happy because it's, I won't actually, in fact, feel happy. You know, I'm thinking Kant yeah, and all yeah. these guys who worked out the uni these universal, that, that it, it's, it's rationally the case that only by being a responsible person who takes into account this a larger picture and not my own selfish needs are are we going to be able to you know achieve the results that we want to i mean these are the kinds of things that philosophers you know talked about ad infinitum you know philosophers haven't figured out either you know, because you can have a million logical arguments. We're still not ethical, hello. You know, this is like, you know, 2020. Are we ethical in this world right now after all the philosophy that we're doing? You know, you see what's going on, for example, in the streets of Delhi yeah. yesterday? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Unbelievable, you know. And so um, I think what I want to do is m maybe explore those arguments, but my main idea is to, con you know, get a conviction, okay, that's the right argument, and then I'm going to condense it. Actually, what I want to maybe use is mantra practice. So one of the things that uh, Buddhists uh, do, there's the mantra of compassion, Om Mani Padme Hum, and um, in my own training with Tibetan teachers, I've seen what they do all the time, because they walk down the street and they're seeing suffering everywhere, and they're constantly going, Om Mani Padme Hum. It's like a repetition of a very short, in fact, it even can be a single syllable, it's like it's like a stamp or an imprint. It's it's condensed in the same way that the this sudden knowledge that I was mentioning is also condensed. Mm -hmm. You there are certain practices in which you deliberately and consciously inculcate certain virtues that you have attached to them deliberately. And you know, I can give an example of myself. I grew up in a household where you know, my mom, you know, made, uh, we ate, you know, mashed potatoes and hamburgers and, and, you know, and string beans, you know, and I grew up eating meat every single day. I actually love the taste of meat. Actually, I'm finally not liking the taste of meat a little bit. You know, it's taken me a really long time. I love eating meat. At a certain point, burgers. and what? Impossible burgers. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, that's what, <laughs> fantastic. No, 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 I'm doing it now. It's yeah. taken me a very, very long time. Yeah. But, you know, I've always loved animals my whole life, and, and, but this really sounds ridiculous, but about the age of 20, I put together that delicious steak is those cows who are in the field over there. Those are the same thing, and the, killing them is what makes this. And it's very, very hard, even today. There's some of the times I, I need some meat, I just have to eat some meat right, right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I go to like, whole, I, I'm actually, I think I eat, I, I'm not eating any more red meat, we're vegan at home, I'm really getting much better, but every now and again I'll, I'll want to eat meat, even though I could have a falafel which has as much protein and, and is good enough and so on. It's very, very hard. Yeah. The re part of the reason is habitual, you know, we're habitually selfish, you know, again I'm drawing directly on Buddhist, you know, practice, we're, our you know, passions and our selfishness is deeply ingrained in us, and you need very kinds of deliberate practices to root them out. You can be, as you were saying, you can be compassionate some of the time, and then be a total jerk yeah. a second later. We see it all the time. And so that's why it, it does take, you know, a great deal of training. 
and that's why I think that my project is going to fail because it's like um, <laughs> we're not going to get the world po right now the world population they're not all going to like oh sit down and start meditating or wh whatever but I do think it does go a certain distance to be able to you know look in the eyes of another creature and I think a lot of cruelty that happens at least some of it I hope yeah. and, and that's my big question how is this project going to help that's a, it's a, like a huge question. Yeah. Uh, this, I really look forward to this project. Um, <laughs> and, and there's more that I can say. I'll get to my question. Um, uh, I'm particularly interested in this ability to determine the kind of selfhood of this natural other. Mm -hmm. and subjectivity. Are yeah, the subject. Self yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and and in different contexts, different words are used, sure. and I'm actually researching this particular question okay. in the Islamic and Christian context. And, okay. and uh, I, have, uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of merit to the phenomenological approach, and there's so there's the I mean, when I'm when and also when I'm like if I'm cooped up for months on end, and then I see like grass in front of me, I jump with joy and that, and that <laughs> yeah. there's this happiness and then I see the same happening with this cow. Yes. Um, and, and it also causes me to feel something good. Um, m my question is, is there also, is there something that we could, there's so much in Buddhist traditions on compassion. Yes. Which, uh, which, is, which is essentially what we're talking about in yes. the end and that's what, that's what we need. And, um, are there for now? I know there's like you know, this great Jataka stories of like the Buddha, like or like the yeah. past incarnations of the Buddha, right. like giving all of his own meat right. to feed the to feed the predators so they doesn't have to right. pray. Um, but uh, are there theories of perception within Buddhist traditions or some resources for s for finding the subjectivity of the other, uh, especially since there's so much on compassion. There's a huge amount on compassion. Um, it's uh, mostly stories, so in other words, imagining or telling stories of the suffering of others and trying to evoke, you know, the, the sort of compassion for the suffering other through stories yeah. is one part of it. There also is, so the, I don't think the Buddhists have exactly, op they opened up the space that I'm trying to open up. There is an assumption in Buddhism that if you see reality, you will naturally be compassionate. And the reason being, reality is such, first of all, it's empty of essence. It, reality has everything to do with I'm not the center of the universe. So when you see reality, you see the whole picture. So there is the assumption that, and so that's the way the story goes. Like, for example, in the Buddha's own enlightenment, mm -hmm. the Buddha, the moment of enlightenment is he not only saw his entire past of all his past lives, but he saw, he actually saw, again, they're using the imagery of seeing, he saw the, the world of all sentient beings and how everybody is, he saw everything. When you see everything, you feel compassion. Yeah. But I mm -hmm. guess, the, the precise kind of, I'm trying to get at the phenomenology of it, I'm not sure that they actually have that. That's a good question, I should know the answer to that. <coughs> well, you're, you're, you're I'm trying I'm to giving <coughs> the answer to that, you're fine. You're I, I feel like some of the stuff stuff that I'm trying to get at, like sort of stuff like noticing the, the grace, for mm -hmm. example, like gathering yeah. together, you know, what are the micro elements of what that seeing looks like? I don't know. And these are, by the way, Buddhist virtues. A lot of times, like, I mean, sometimes they are so often reduced to something that, like mindfulness, and that these absolutely which yeah. we hear this attentiveness and this noticing. Yes, mm -hmm. right. But it's not mm -hmm. so much. There isn't a practice to walk around noticing yeah. all the suffering on the street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's mostly about paying attention to yeah. your own, mm -hmm. uh, you know, passions and and aggressions and so on. Yes. But in thinking about uh, this idea of, of like the caring and invoking caring, I think about this a lot. Like as someone who spends like from after dinner through the night, 
at the feet of an individual female spider, you know, in the mountains. So like mm. deep attention and then noticing wait, wait, wait. how what, they dance. You, you've been sure. in the mountains at the feet of a spider? <laughs> what do you, That's you? my, I, I do research on okay. spiders. So I've lived you, in remote bush camps where I've been living without walls for a year with wow. lemurs and oh, you know, wow. chameleons. But I've also now I focus on these mountain building mason spiders. So like last summer, Canada USA sponsored me to pull up a special camera. And so I only had it for a short amount of time. So we would go out after dinner, find a female, and then be with her through the night. Oh, really? And then I'd leave in the morning. Why and would you, what, what were you doing with her? So each year they gave me different camera equipment, which allowed me to see and discover different things. And it would also, I would impact the spider in different ways, right? right? So sure. the first, the first, some, the first year it was like a camera that I had to be an inch and a half away. Mm -hmm. So I'm obviously impacting these animals right. that are very similar in vibration. Right. Then they gave me something where I could be farther back, farther back, and mm -hmm. then they gave me this camera where I could film at night with very little light in wow. color. Wow. Which are these cameras that are using on the border right now? Wow. ISIS. Oh my wow. God. And yeah. so I wow. felt sort of good about taking these cameras away right. from me. Yeah. For, for two weeks right. ago. Right. But but I but I, I'm feel, I'm trying to understand a certain behavior mm -hmm. and it happens at night and we're trying to understand this and so I'm part of that landscape in okay. many ways that you described. Mm -hmm. but one of the things I think about then we find out these amazing things like you know that spiders mm -hmm. might dance or make mm -hmm. music for each other mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. some of my research colleagues then put those videos on and then you get that caring. Mm -hmm. Right, but then it's a double-edged sword, mm -hmm. like Close. peacock spiders. Right, so Jurgen Otto finds them in Utah, in, in Australia, does all these amazing videos, and then they end up in the pet tree. Uh, right, so I'm on the internet. Mm -hmm. I'm like part of the International Union of the Conservation for Nature, where we talk a lot about red listing and things like this. Mm -hmm. So, with this caring, I think it like caring to coveting, and then yeah. how yeah. how do we how do we do that? Because I often right in your camp with thinking, you know, how, do you, how do I share the beauty and wonder of what I experienced? That's right. And then I'm over at the museum where we have to be very careful with sharing. Like, like how, how do That's you, right, how even do letting people know that you have these amazing creatures because people are going to like want to capture them and mm -hmm. have them. Yeah, so it's like a, it's, it's something I struggle with and I I'm sort of intersects this argument that, or the ethics piece that you're you have to think of all those things, and you have to be very clever. And and part of the being attuned and aware is noticing all the pieces of what's happening in a particular context. So being aware of the pet trade and all of these other things, being aware of people's, you know, um, you know which people are going to come in, and being very clever and being very skillful. It's a huge. I mean, you know, the task that we're facing right now on the planet is like, you know, daunting to the utmost degree. Yeah. But the more that, so the thing about at least the pet trade, hmm. you know, if you're attuned and aware of the animal, the one of the things you have to see is that it's happier when it's in the forest, in the mountain, than and it's in your stupid house in like a glass box that you, for you, you know, you got to be able to see that. And that it might be your argument people will say is but we're in a culture that's so divorced from the connection with the land and nature that by allowing a classroom or a child or a museum to have a tarantula no. that people can have experience you can that's see it on video you, you don't have to go to a you don't have I'm to just go. Saying, yeah. like right no no how, no like because right across the street here we have them in the museum oh, wow. but not alive yes they're alive yes Harvard okay has them in part of the collection yeah for so teaching. i'm completely against so, that but but it's like, um, um, so I'm, I'm glad to be part of this dialogue with you because it's, right. it's so it is it's a huge and there's so many tentacles that reach into so many different issues you know there's people who will say you know you're against the factory farming but all these people have jobs there mm -hmm. and you know what are you going to do about there they're all going to be out of jobs when you throw when you stop you know or whatever I mean there's there's there and we we really need to think all these things through but I do think the one at, at the minimum, um, uh, you know, first of all, I don't think we're divorced from the land. You know, mm. maybe some people who live in an apartment building on the 20th floor, like, and you know, some concrete block. I mean, it, most people, there's land, there's still land. Mm. It's there for us to see. 
and we have to train ourselves to be aware of it more. But most of all, I, I think it's, so you're right, and I, I have to, what you guys are saying is very helpful to me. I have to work in, you know, this is in the ethics part. A huge part of this has to be the presumptions that people have about what, you know, I deserve to have. And, and we need to have a huge amount of restraint. This is the place where we have to see that, you know, yes, I might like to have this gorgeous creature. You know, I, the horrible exotic animal trade that happens when people, you know, feel that they're entitled mm -hmm. to have a tiger, mm -hmm. a tiger in their house. It, you know, I get so infuriated and enraged. And it's partially because the tiger is such a beautiful creature. You've got to recognize it doesn't, you know, and oh, they get like a dog. And so the tiger plays with the dog all day. But it's horrible, you know, that's why I, you know, I get into fights with people even about having cats. Like, I don't want to keep my cat in, you know, people say you shouldn't let your cat outside because it's going to kill birds. And I, re and I have a bell on my cat, that's a, that's a whole problem. But, mm. you know, we don't have the right to capture animals at all. You know, we don't have the right to, remember what was Casey in the class, this wonderful woman who's in the law school, maybe you weren't in, in that Oh, class. M, uh, a MC. MC. Yeah. MC. Yeah. Who made this passionate oh. on the last day of class, like, you know, no reason, because we, in the last day of class, we tried to imagine what does the world look like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what would the, you know, what would you do if you became queen of the uni universe right now, and you could, you know, what would be the first thing on day one, what would you do, and we were talking about one, she's, had this whole thing about, you know, no physical barriers where you restrain mm. another being. Mm. Um, yeah. But, you know, we don't deserve to have these beautiful creatures in our house. Mm. And at this point, we don't need zoos anymore. Maybe in the past we did, but you got fantastic video. You mm. can, you have the videos you're taking, you can put them, they can all see it. They don't need them in Harvard Zoo. Mm. You know, and you, you gotta like grow up a little bit, you know, with, with your kids. Your kids, yeah. you don't say, I want my kids to see. No, your kids don't get to see everything. Mm -hmm. You don't go to go inside the Amazon jungle. No, you don't. We don't all have the right to go in, in there. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. I, you know, excuse me if I'm getting mad, because I really get mad about this. Yes. But I think we're already constraining the animals just by loss of habitat, by oil and gas motivations. Yeah. Um, where pronghorn in Wyoming, you know, used to run freely, they can't cross fences. Um, so in that sense, I think there's a constraint. And one of the questions, and Jenna, I just think this is such profoundly radical, beautiful work. And just your own um, Buddhist practice and understanding, bringing that to bear on these issues, I think is so powerful. Um, one of the things I would love to ask with everyone around here and with your mind and heart, you know, now that we are in this climate catastrophe or crisis, however we refer to it, it seems to me, just in the familiarity of where we live, that the animals are, are reaching out to us, mm -hmm. you know, are coming to us in ways I've never noticed before. Mm -hmm. And so in your project, you know, what about that, that not only our awareness of them, but the recognition of their awareness of us and where is that meeting and reciprocity you know in the same way that it feels like the earth is rising up um, the earth is has its own agency and what do we do with that and it may not be positive either what may not be positive not positive for humans yeah, yeah. oh yeah but yeah. in other words right the earth yeah. is is responding Mm -hmm. um, to the aggressions that we're giving in aggressive ways. <coughs> right. And so I just That's think right. about... <coughs> Animals could respond as well in aggressive ways. <coughs> the, what that looks like. Even um, living beings like viruses. You know, so it mm -hmm. goes into this whole, almost a science, <coughs> science um, fiction realm, which in, if you look at David Quammen's book, Spillover, about these viruses, most of them have their roots in um, the animal trade. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So all of these complexities yeah, of response. Yeah. yeah. And I guess my last question to you is, um, and we talked about this privately, but the power of your the word aleatory. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about that a bit more? 
is part of what it means to be seeing reality that the aleatory means A, that everything is changing, and B, that everything is not under my control, and that I'm continually surprised by things that I'm not expecting. And rather than having an attitude that I'm going out in the world today in order to conquer and control and figure everything out. So it's an attitude that respects and understands that I may have some control and I can do some things, but I don't have absolute control and I need to deal with, you learn to deal better with what comes to me rather than always trying to impose my will on everything. Hmm. And sometimes you get the, the, some of the most beautiful moments of our life is when we dance and play within those moments. Like one of my favorite things is, you know, which happens in our community here, we all know each other, we're walking to our various schools and when you cross paths with someone and you have like this really brief encounter, and which often tends to be very, very joyful and playful, and somebody will mention, you know, the weather, and you know, and it's like you just interact and play, and then separate, you know. So I think, you know, and artists use this a lot, you know, and especially the notion of improvisation, which is obviously a big thing. Is there's something really more beautiful and real in not? trying to go out and, and control everything, but allowing that which is unexpected and not in your control to, to play a part and recognize it and respond to it and accept it or use it or make lemonade when you're given lemons, make lemonade, you know, kind of thing. That whole range of activities. And I think animals by force work that way all the time. Animals don't mm -hmm. expect to control everything at all. They're constantly shifting their, you know, way that they're positioning themselves. You know, and you can see them. You watch the part of the thing you watch with my cats. You know, the, their ears are they're listening. Mm. You know, if if you like all inside your own head, you're not even listening. Mm. Yeah. If you're listening, you know, and then there's all these noises. You know, she, she doesn't know what they are. She know she's not expecting them, but she's responding. Yeah. The other question about you know, I mean, I. It's a huge question, and how we're going to figure any of this out, I don't know, and we may not. You know, in fact, we won't. It'll just happen on its own in some way or another. But I do think that the more we cultivate the ability to see and to listen, the better off we'll be. You know, and maybe in some ways the much more modest part of my project is those of us who can hear this kind of thing will have a m much richer life if we do that it doesn't but you know how we're going to solve the big problems that we have on this planet you know martha nussbaum was here about a year ago she's also working on animal ethics right now and you know she was talking about the whole thing you know there's some people who like want to get rid of the whole human apparatus and just go back to the wild or go back to a previous time when nature was more and and she she was making the case that we're not able to do that. It's actually not possible. We've created a whole mess that we cannot just snap our fingers and get rid of. So it is incumbent upon us to work as hard as we can to try and figure it out with the best kind of science. You know, what was this lady's name here who left now? Sarah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, why did I just go? Uh, science, using yeah. science to respond. To yeah, I, I forget. Mess. Anyway, I lost my train of thought. But anyway, um, we can't undo the mess that we created. Mm. Um, yes, that's all. Can't go back. Changes in the creation can't just absent ourselves. No, that's right. And we and and yeah, you know. But so. But yeah, so her kind of science, she's aware that that's what I wanted to say. You know, there's a whole trend right now in the sort of so-called the post-human movement is very much about seeing all the different vectors and implications of any given, you know, so seeing the, the, the animal trade, you know, being out there in the forest, in the cave, and knowing that what she's doing is actually gonna cause, 
you know, new trade patterns and new patterns of greed and so on. So being intelligent and knowing all the various connections so that you know the implications of what you're doing and how it's going to Im impact stuff. And, you know, you do have really good intentioned people, you know, who think, oh, I'm going to save this. You know, like, for example, ethical decisions, like you see an animal in the forest who's dying mm -hmm. and you want to drag it to your house and maybe take care of it when it might sometimes be the best solution to be able to allow it to die in peace. You know, so all kinds of, all kinds of, of moral decisions, you know, mm -hmm. but we really need to talk about a lot of things. But at least we got to be good at noticing and, and, and being attentive. That's like number one. Yeah, what you were talking about, slow looking and fast looking, mm -hmm. um, the attentiveness, that's a lot of what uh, I do a Tai Chi practice and that's a lot of what we work with. Yeah. And what you were uh, talking about, fast looking, uh, a lot of what you've been talking about reminds me of <coughs> Inside of a Dog by Alexander. Yes, uh, Horowitz. And, right, and, and how yeah. The dog's eyes are actually biologically they can see faster than we can. So mm -hmm. when when mm -hmm. it looks like they're being extra spontaneous, it's like their bi biology is mm -hmm. better than ours in that respect. Yeah. But mm -hmm. ours is better in other ways. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so mm -hmm. like going back to your the, the differences and the sameness. Um, okay. And when you started talking about the thick present, mm -hmm. I was thinking also about the notion of expanding the your perception of the present not like three seconds or five mm -hmm. seconds but and and looking to other beings and how their presence mm -hmm. are perhaps different from ours like mm -hmm. trees their notion Absolutely. of present mm -hmm. it, it would be very different or a mountain or you know not assuming that present is only a human yeah. present. Is, yeah. is that part of what you're... Yeah, no, that's very much in tune with... I mean, as you were speaking, I realized that there's a way in which <coughs> one might always be present, so the present would last forever. But part of that present is that it's always changing. changing. It's, not, it's not static. You know, even for a mountain, it's shifting. Right. You know, right. and a tree is changing and moving and growing. But those are great models, you know. And certainly, things like mountains and trees are models for, you know, in Buddhism for meditation. Like, be like the mountain. You know, in other mm -hmm. words, you know, be able to be on that time scale. So absolutely. And, and in Tai Chi world, you know, everyone thinks, oh, Tai Chi is really slow fighting. It's like we're always talking about your mind has to be very quick okay. to, yeah. to respond right. to yeah. those That's constant right. changes, yeah. Yeah. you know, even though you're moving slow. Right. Well, one of the things that I've figured out is that if you can go really slow, you can notice micro shifts that you don't, and then you can respond to them really quickly because you can see more. So you, so that's one of the ways that the slow and the fastness go together. Go together. Yeah. 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 But the thing about dogs and stuff like that about them being you know but it's it's awesome when we realize that they have capacities that we don't one of the things the dogs can really do is 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 you know size up you know how dogs will sometimes bark unexplainedly at one person and they're like picking up something you know <coughs> and it could be wrong you know too it's not that so that like these you know you know split decision these what are they called not, not split decisions Split second. Split second. What? Split, split second, second decisions. Yeah, split second decisions, or there, there's an NPR show. What is it called? S split something. Anyway, but these very quick decisions are sometimes wrong. I jump to quick conclusions a lot of times, and I'm wrong. So it it really does require, you know, a lot of training, a lot of self consciousness, and a lot of self restraint. But definitely a big part of it is to be very cautious about what you're projecting. So that's why I am emphasizing. You know, it's not all you, and it's not all that, you know, shut the hell up for a minute and, mm -hmm. and watch <laughs> what the others are doing. And just shut up <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, two things. 
want. Terry, when you said this thing about you think that the animals are reaching out to us in ways that you've never seen before, um, it made me think about um, the fires in Australia. And um, yeah. my brother was, my brother who immigrated to Australia and lives and works there now was right in the middle of all of that. Mm -hmm. And I was keeping very close touch with him because his house was about to burn down. Um, it was really terrifying. And my sister-in-law, um, months and months ago, was telling me about the terribleness of the drought there. Mm -hmm. And she said, I've been putting out um, plates of water for the kangaroos and the echidnas and the koalas who are all coming out of the bush. And they're you know, starving. So she, she and other people all over their little town were putting out water for the animals. But then when the fires came, the animals really started coming out of the bush. And they started coming up to people. Mm -hmm. They started like coming up to people and like, you know, like making contact and like, can you give me some water? And mm -hmm. so there were these amazing videos of people like, like koalas coming up to truck drivers or bicyclists yeah. and just climbing up onto them. Mm -hmm. and. And then the person would give them water. Animals know that humans are smart, and animals yeah. animals know that humans yeah. have res resources. Yeah. And they yeah. often they don't want to have anything to do with us if they can avoid it. But right. when they're in yeah. trouble, they know that humans can help them. Yeah. I've seen videos also of like um, I don't know several different ones of animals who somehow got in the water and were in the in the middle of a large lake and were drowning and saw a boat and knew to swim to the boat and they knew that these people like kittens i think somebody like threw some kittens in like the middle of the lake and these kittens like figured out like go to another boat and the people can help you and stuff like that mm -hmm. but yeah it's just tragic so it just makes me um i don't know i just have this vision of being held kind of a very scary and dark vision, but, you know, like, animals actually coming to us. It's in, you know, not saying, but in, in <coughs> whatever language they can express it. You, know, you I wonder, need I wonder what does that look like. I, I heard a talk, by the way, very recently. I was very excited. Some guy's writing a, a, a dissertation in the Asian studies. He's working on Borneo during the period when the British were <coughs> arriving there to extract a crude oil. Yeah. And he's looking at literature, though. So there's a lot of stuff in literature, which is not exactly 100%. So I walked in like the middle of the talk, and the, the novels by some Chinese guy was like about how like the wild pigs of Borneo bonded together and formed armies, and, and they had a king, and he had all these pictures of them and how they actually started attacking humans and were, and, and, and I thought he was talking about something that actually had happened. Uh -huh. and because, you know, it wasn't very far from yeah. what I think actually could happen. Yeah. It was this fantastic, and then it did turn out that it was like a novel, but, um, yeah. I just, though, you know, in, in, I, I just was reading, um, and I, I cannot remember the title of the actual essay that I was reading, but it was in a book, a collection of essays called Critically Sovereign, that was about um, feminism and indigenous culture. And the dirty was in the title of the, <laughs> um, the essay. But it was, um, it was about this sort of history of, um, in, in indigenous cultures, of um, erotic stories of women falling in love with non-human beings. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, the woman who falls in love with the star, and the woman who falls in love with the stick, and the woman who falls in love with the, right? And, and this kind of notion of, I, I mean, I think you would find it a really interesting okay. essay in relation to what you're saying, but I think that there is some sense in which um, this kind of, that I, I don't know that it's like that, that animals and, and other beings in nature are communicating with us in a way they never have before. It's mm. that maybe, like, yeah. you know, like I would, like what I think of is in, in um, and this is like you know, from my childhood, so I don't know how many of you actually like read the Chronicles of Narnia as children, but there's this scene in the last battle where there's these dwarves and they're sitting around in a dark cottage, except that there's no dark cottage. They're just sitting there 
not being able to see because they believe they're in a dark cottage and that they can't get out of. And everybody else is going on around them, like even like trying to get their attention, and they're like, we're stuck in this dark cottage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think there's some sense in which like a lot of these sort of principles, um, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of positivism and like Descartes' whole animals don't have souls thing right. and all that, like gave us this belief that we're sitting mm -hmm. in a dark cottage. Yeah. And, and like, I mean, I guess I kind of feel like when you look at these sort of older stories and how many animal guides and spirit guides are in those stories that, um, that maybe, you know, animals in nature have been talking to us all along and we just kind of blinded ourselves to it for a while and we're maybe learning again how to, how to hear what's being said to us. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that that's true. But uh, I'll, I'll look up what the name of that essay is. Okay, and send it yes, it's really, really beautiful. You know, I think animals communicate all the time, and we don't we don't pay any attention to them. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, you know, so the idea, you know, getting back to Terry is a really interesting idea. So, you know, in terms of on an individual level, animals try to communicate with us all the time, and we generally don't can't read and mm -hmm. we can't hear them because we uh, just can't follow what they're saying. You know, and it, I think it is possible to to see a lot of what they're saying to us. But you raised a slightly different, bigger idea that somehow the animal world is recognizing what's happening to the planet and the crisis mm -hmm. that we're in at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting idea. I mean, and I agree the thing, you know, with the burning forest in Australia, you know, and you think about birds who, you know, migrating birds who don't have place to land. Mm -hmm. um, and all, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, so th this is the problem. How do you conceptualize what their intentionality is? Mm -hmm. It's not as though all the animals, like in the middle of the night, got together and, you know, said, okay, guys, let's sit down. How are we mm -hmm. going to communicate with these stupid humans right now? So something different. The, the way that they're communicating that's part of what this project is about, is being able to hear different kinds of communications. And disorientation. Pardon? Disorientation. You know, mm -hmm. it was interesting being with some Cajun shrimpers, and this one man was known all over the bayous as knowing impeccably where he was and where the shrimp were. Mm -hmm. And he had tremendous status in the community because of that. Mm -hmm. But with the situation now where they're losing a football field of soil every yes, day, right, yeah. um, mm -hmm. he, he became lost mm -hmm. because all of the, right, the yes. signals or the, the landmarks right, were yes. gone. That's right. mm -hmm. And he said for the first time, I now know what the birds feel like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's a disorientation where the birds don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. So I wonder in mm -hmm. your practices, what is there a Buddhist teaching about disorientation or yeah. I mean what what are our own experiences if in fact we're we too are animals it's like we're in deep trouble I don't mm -hmm. I don't have a Buddhist answer to that I think that's absolutely right that's why one of the reasons why we can hear is because we are disoriented yeah. you know yeah part of the question is have we ever been truly oriented or has it only been certain special people who have been able, you know, individuals in a community who have special powers to pay attention. But we certainly are disoriented now. But at the same time, you have people like mm -hmm. all of us sitting here in the room, you know, we're not going to know where the shrimp are, but we can, we, there are a lot of things that we do still know, put it this way. And it goes back to that notion of where do we dwell? Mm -hmm. you know, yes. Where do we know where we are? Well, do we know where we are? And that's why I wouldn't jump to this conclusion, oh, we are totally divorced from nature. Mm -hmm. We're not. Yeah. We are in, we're still in nature. We still have directionality, you know, but certain talents and capacities have been favored over others. But we, we've, we have a lot more knowledge than we are generally conscious of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 
I think you made an interesting point earlier about brain, and I think so much of what we're talking about is that we try to think things through. We try to make them logical. We try to rationalize them. Where there's the possibility that animals don't think things through. There, there's a reaction. There's, well, that's the question. Yeah, and that we have that same cap capacity, but our brains are so powerful, we outthink ourselves. Right. Well, we do also have reactions. <laughs> <laughs> we both have, we, we have both of those things. But I'm trying to get to that space in between the super brainy and the purely impulsive. There's an intermediate space. And that's where, you know, a lot of the science right now, which is, you know, there's a huge amount of science about how much smarter animals are than we ever thought in the last 20 years. Like, that's, like, amazing. And so many different species are so much more intelligence so I'm trying to figure out what their intelligence looks like what is it so it's not like you know total like instinct so that's the word that's been used yeah. instinct you know that's the way you explain away everything instinct what does that mean yeah nothing yeah you know so they figure stuff out they yeah. have ways of, they rationalize they have logic you know my cat when he looked at me with the dish towel he said oh Mom's probably gonna like do the thing because she's so obsessed with wiping the counters. She's not gonna. She's not gonna bother me right now. He thought it out. I see him thinking. He stands in the middle of the house and he's saying, "Shall I sleep up there or shall I sleep over here?" And he's like looking up, and then he, you know, he's thinking. They do think. But what's interesting is trying to figure out it's slightly different, you know, and it's just gonna expand on stuff yeah. that we do know. Um, there's a book called Other Minds mm -hmm. that talks about consciousness. There's a, two books that came out two years ago specifically around how an octopus thinks yeah. and the development of consciousness. But of the two books, I think Other Minds is, is worth reading. Is that um, the one on octopuses? They actually? both are both okay. books. There's mm -hmm. one that's called I, it The Mind of my heart with the oct octopus thing. Yeah. Yeah. But they talk about consciousness in general and recognizing consciousness and recognizing decision making, um, which you might enjoy. Um, but I have a question, actually, back to Buddhism question. Um, so um, I don't have any background in, in uh, Buddhist studies or in, in scholarly work in, Buddhist, um, in the Buddhist system. Um, but I, I am interested in, because I, I deeply appreciate the compassion aspects, the recognizing of other life, what you're talking about, subjectivity. Um, and I'm curious if there's also room for a non-hierarchical understanding of uh, progression through lives because um, I find that uh, I often hear and again this is an ignorance um, I often hear like oh humans are at the pinnacle of what the cycles of lives are um, and I personally disagree with that but mm -hmm. I'm curious if in your work if you've come across alternative views in uh, progression if there I'm not sure is a progression that, for progression <laughs> but um it like is towards like enlightenment or something. Oh right, no, no, no. Because of the Buddhist. So this is not 100% a Buddhist project. What this is is me using resources and many things I've learned from Buddhism. But it's not, and it's certainly about compassion, which is a big Buddhist thing. But it's not, it's not tied to Buddhist stuff. I don't feel obliged to be loyal to you know Buddhist ideas. And one, it is the case that Buddhists definitely say that only human beings can get enlightenment. Mm. On the other hand, so Buddhism is a big religion and it's got lots of different stuff. There's a huge amount of, you know, wonderfully compassionate, you know, insight and literature about the suffering and plight of animals. Do all these things fit together into one big picture, consistent picture? No. And that's true of any religion. So I'm cherry picking what's valuable to me and not necessarily in this project. It's not Buddhism per se. You know, I've been deeply influenced by my ways of thinking, but it's not, and it's not the only thing that's influenced me by any means. Were, were you gonna say something about yeah. the octopus? I was, I was thinking about this discussion that I'm sort of thinking totally out loud and Please. about these ideas of you know, intelligences, animal intelligences, and the thing that I keep thinking about, and, and it's sort of a partially formed thought, so mm -hmm. I love dialogue with this, is this idea of like, we as a species haven't been around all that long, and, and you have 
animals that have been evolving for hundreds of millions of years, and that there's this evolutionary force that is almost an intelligence in its, in its own right, Absolutely. and this driver. And I, I'm thinking about like work I did on beetles, where you know for the longest time, you know, like you'd see the two lions out in the out in the savanna, and the male biologist would see the male lion mount the lioness and check it off as mating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then later on, you actually have a male biologist sort of looking at the evolution of this amazing ornate morphology in animal genitalia that you see across taxa, uh -huh. like hundreds of millions of years of evolution, tons of bells and whistles. Why would this be happening? Mm -hmm. And looking at this, mm -hmm. and then looking more deeply. And, why would what be happening? Why would you? Like, you just need to transfer sperm yeah. to create. Why do they have these ornate genitalia? Why would you have all these? Why would you have like bifunctional penis? Why would yeah. you have things with? all kinds of, or it looks like right. Baroque architecture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. why, yeah. why would this happen across mm -hmm. taxa? Right. Yeah. You know, hundreds of thousands of species have these sort of ornate structures. Why? Okay. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And then looking at, I, I looked at beetles with him, and, and so you see, you know, all of this, what you can be considered coital courtship and, mm -hmm. and, and female choice, that females have way more choice than that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that as we're thinking about intelligences, there's also this, huge evolutionary drive and force mm -hmm. that's going on between the individuals of that species and then in all the myriad of interconnections that they have with the entire world around them and that's all right. the other inhabitants of right. And so I think of that that huge driver of evolution that we have only had working on us as a species for just a half a millisecond, really, mm -hmm. when we look at the rest of that's right. the animals we're living with. Right. Although we do track back to other things that were yeah, humans, eventually. but we've been yeah. around as well. Yeah. Back but there. like in the modern form, say, spiders are like in the modern form for hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of years. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, you know, it's, and, and we have like over 48,000 described species, which just is a fraction of them. And we're just, mm -hmm. everybody in this room, we're just all the same species. Well, we figured out some things, you know, and we got this language, and we got a couple of tools, and yeah. that's gone by berserk. <laughs> yes, you know, and we, did not, we did not anticipate all the, you know, all the entailments of what it was going to, you know, and, but we are, we do have power, and it looks very much like we're going to destroy the entire planet. I mean, that's really the likely, as far as I can tell. You know, it looks pretty, you know. Well, we're going to destroy ourselves. For yeah, us. We'll we're going to destroy. The we'll and for other species. Well, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, whatever. We're not doing well. We, you know, <laughs> we're really not doing well. Uh, so we, we can't, you know, and at this point, like I think you, you were saying, you know, if, if someone were to say to me right now, I've thought about this a lot, you know, we're going to snap our fingers, we're going to take away all the technology and the stuff, we're going to take away all the humans and just have everybody else here, and we won't have any humans anymore. We won't have literature, we won't have philosophy, we won't have art, just have the whole animal world and no humans. Would you say yes? No. i say yes. I'd say no just because I'm a selfish human and I don't want to die, and I assume that I would be dead. And that's You're not still young. I might say I'm still young. young. <laughs> no, in the so scenario, I get to live, so I, I could be <laughs> that all the animals. That changes animals, it. Yeah. That changes but we are it. animals, right? Like, no, we, but we one species of following, animals. Right, we have been following our own nature. Yeah. yeah but what is our nature? That's it's a very complicated, you know, when you're thinking right. in terms of evolution, Absolutely. what does, you know, intelligence, the ability to write, the ability mm. to speak, you know, all these kind of very, very complex technologies which twist stuff around and all of a sudden, mm. it may still be evolution, but it's a type of evolution that, that works on very different principles and, and so on. But anyway, if we could get rid of, <laughs> I mean, we lose a lot, but to be honest, I'd rather have, a, you know, a jungle and the animals eating each other, and but nonetheless enjoying their lives up till then, and having parents and, and families. Mm -hmm. I would rather, have, you know, at this point. Mm -hmm. um, can I? It's eight o'clock. Okay. So I want to be mindful. Like we can all sit and talk with you. I, I mean, I'm sure we would all love to sit and talk with you for much longer, but I want to be mindful of your time. Mm -hmm. And okay, not, I'm you know. fine, but I don't know okay. whether we need to close the building. Are there? No, I, as long as you know, I'm here as the yeah. You're the, you're the, I can the, hang the, out, the so you can hang out. But okay. I just didn't want to, 
you know, keep you task when you need to go. Okay, thanks very much. I will go in maybe a few more minutes, but um, but um, but yeah, this is fantastic. Thank you all so much for. Uh, mentioned that we're in Louisiana. These people caught like bushels of crabs and shrimp and threw them in these pots and boiled them alive and they yeah. made them they were really amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but both of us after I mean we didn't want to like uh, disrupt this amazing thing they were doing so we didn't say anything but both of yeah. us afterwards said we really struggled with that, sure. watching that happen. Yeah, I know. And so Thank you. Thank you. How, how do we deal with this? Because the conversation we're having tonight, to me, is I feel like I'm at home. I feel like this is exactly what I believe. And yet, so much of the world is like, you know, Trump's son just got a permit to kill a grizzly bear. And I know, right. so excited about it. And I feel like, I want a permit to kill him. I mean, sorry, but... <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I'm not sure I don't yeah. feel that way. You know? yeah. yeah, so I what, how do we <laughs> deal with that difference in, what is it, consciousness or experience or education? What is it? What's what is the difference? It? Between it, us and them? Yeah. At the same time, we're not perfect either. No. That's the other thing. When we say yes and then. It's very, very complicated, but we need to figure out a new ethics and a way of living on this planet is basically what we need to do. You know, and one of the things, you have people who advocate for uh, uh, genetically altering tigers so they won't be predators anymore. You know, one of the things we have to deal with is the fact that animals are predators and they do kill each other. And by the way, everybody eats a form of life, and especially if you believe that plants have a form of sentience, there's no way to survive on the planet without eating another. So what's the right way in that? You know, and it's, it's a very, very complicated conversation that we have to have that it's gonna have to take into account a lot, a lot of different factors. That's why I keep going nuts, you know, I feel like I've opened up this, you know, at least for myself, like if I want to write a book, how many topics am I going to deal with? But, you know, to the degree that it's about ethics, you know, because you watch these video, these shows, you know, you see like a beautiful zebra or a beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, elk or whatever prancing through the wilderness and then a tiger gets it and the, and the elk is crying and he's, his neck is like extended and you know and the tiger doesn't care and just holds him you know until he's dead and he's going to eat that and we have to we have to that we have to see that as part of the, the solution and we have to separate it from the like wealthy hunter who kills of course. the giraffe yeah there's just no says, question this was the like me of the most important thing I ever did was like kill this giraffe who was standing out there. Right, because the, when the hunter kills the giraffe and the tiger kills the giraffe, they're two very right. different things. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and somebody who takes pleasure out of killing a beautiful, gorgeous sentient being, I don't know what to say to them. You know, if I'm in front of them, I'll just lay down on the floor and cry and weep and beg them, and that's all. Mm -hmm. That greed and aggression in that person when you can't find a way to grapple with it, and you're, you're yourself civilized and not greedy, and that's really important to you, there's such a difference in just simply aggression levels. But how do you how do you balance the commons and the problems yeah. we face with this unregulated and apparently unregulatable greed that's built? No. I'm wondering if, um, and, and I'm sorry more of the people that were in my Amazon group at the time when we were reading her, but are, have you encountered um, Marie Bird data? I, I'm, I may be mispronouncing her last name. I was told recently that I was. Um, she's an anthropologist who is, is a big voice in talking about animism. Mm -hmm. and she, What's her name? The, her name is Nareep, 
and I've been pronouncing it Bird David, but I'm told that that may be How do you spell it? Like Bird Dash David. Okay. <laughs> um, she wrote a book called Us Relatives, okay. um, but she also wrote several other articles. But one of the things that she really brought into the conversation about animism was this question about scale. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the things that mm -hmm. she brings up at the beginning of Us Relatives is um, this, like, that, that, like, just in terms of our neurobiology, our mind is only capable of holding so many mm -hmm. kind of either kind of relationships, right? Like individual, right. like individual yeah. to individual relationships. Right. And after that, like, we have to categorize. Right. And that, that this is like a difference that is a, you know, in, in our sort of modern global culture, and, and I say global religion because I'm really interested in terms of animism and indigeneity, but um, this kind of idea that once we put things in categories, um, like that there, because she uses, the reason I'm thinking about her is because you use this term being with. And mm -hmm. so the, the group of people that she studied, um, that was a, 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 you know, the entire culture, there were like maybe 70 people in it.